All right, so if you got your Bibles and you want to turn to John chapter 3 with me, I want to thank uh, Grant and, uh, and Ryan for filling in the last two weeks so that while I was on vacation this time, I did not have to think about a sermon and prepare, and I can actually, I was actually able to get some, some rest, and that was a, it was a great time. And I appreciate, you, again, you church family for supporting us um, in that, uh, encouraging those times of rest, um, and uh, appreciate this church that, uh, that believes in the pastoral uh, staff uh, here, and um, yeah, it's a great family to be a part of. Uh, we are studying the book of uh, John, we are still very new into that, and so if you haven't been with us, you haven't missed I mean, you miss some great sermons, but you only miss a couple chapters, you know. And uh, you can go online, you can watch those uh, to catch up, uh, or not. But uh, we're, we're here in John chapter 3, and that's what I want to remind or We're going to start at the end of chapter 2, uh, because, you know, the, in the original Bible, uh, when it was written down in Greek or Hebrew, if it's Old Testament, Hebrew, New Testament, Greek, they didn't write, they didn't have uh, chapters, they didn't have verses, it was just one word after the next. Uh, in fact, uh, they didn't even have, in the Greek, they didn't have spaces. Uh, it just one letter right after the, the next. Um, and the, 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 the chapters and the verses were added a long time after the Bible was written to help us when we had like the printing press so that we can tell you, hey, turn to 3 1, and then, okay, we can all do that together. Uh, back in the day, they didn't have their own Bibles uh, because it was, not, it was too expensive. And so they didn't need chapter and verse. So, but if somebody came along then and put chapters and verses in there, and sometimes they did a great job and sometimes not so much. And uh, so sometimes the thought uh, doesn't end at the end of a chapter. You need to keep going into the next chapter, and they, they, they spill over. And this, I believe, is one of those, those cases. And so we're going to look at uh, starting at the end of chapter 2. But what we studied last time in, in John was the cleansing of the temple. Jesus so far has given two signs of his Messiah-ness, uh, that he's the Messiah. Uh, one was turning the water to wine in Cana up north in Galilee. And then now he's come down for the Passover in uh, Jerusalem. And as he entered into the temple grounds, he was appalled that people were selling uh, things, uh, changing money and all that, for offerings and stuff like that. It wasn't all, all bad, but the fact is that it was, it was impeding worship. And so he overthrew the tables. He drove them out. This is the Lord's place. It's a place of prayer. It's a place of worship for all people. And, uh, and that's kind of where we, we left him. Uh, he's in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover and People started, you know, he was doing other kind of signs and works there. And so let's start in chapter uh, 2, verse 23. It says, while he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all and because he did not need anyone to testify about man. For he himself knew what was in man. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Okay, we're going to stop there right now. Uh, so, you know, he's doing these signs. People are believing in his name. What does that mean? It sounds like a good thing. Oh, they're believing in his name, right? But they were not believing in who he actually was. And so the story that we're going to come into in chapter 3 is the story of Jesus meeting with Nicodemus, a religious leader, a Pharisee, the teacher of the law. And Nicodemus is going to show us what these people were believing when it says that they believed in his name, but he wouldn't entrust himself to them. Uh, this is a play on words in the Greek. It says they were believing in him, but the word entrust is to believe in. He wasn't believing in them. The believe and trust is the same, same word. So they were trusting in him, in his name, but he wasn't entrusting himself to them. Why not? Because their belief was not really belief in who he actually was. It says he, and you heard this repetition as I read this, uh, the word man. 
right? It says uh, he, he didn't need anyone to testify about a man, for he himself knew what was in a man. And then ver- chapter 3 says, there was a man. Okay. So Jesus knows what is in the hearts of men. And John is showing us, here's an example of one of those men. One of those men who said they believed, but what did they believe? Their belief was incomplete. It wasn't sufficient for salvation. And so Jesus wasn't reveling in the fact that everybody was believing in him. They saw the signs that he was doing. Uh, They're putting their their trust in him. They're, They're believing in him, but it's wrong. They're not actually believing in who he is. Jesus wasn't saying, oh, yes, everybody's following me. That's wonderful. That's great. Why? Uh, let's look at uh, this, this encounter with the Pharisee named Nicodemus. And let's pray as, uh, as we enter uh, into this, this story. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us through your word. May your Holy Spirit convict us of whatever it is that we need conviction of. Would, it, oh, would you open up our hearts or our minds to whatever it is that you need to say to us today that we can have a bigger view of who you are and more complete understanding of uh, what you are here, what you came here to do and what you are doing now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. All right. So uh, what is this belief that doesn't lead to salvation? Uh, In verse 2, chapter 3, it says, This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Okay. This is what it says. Uh, This is uh, what his belief was in. What does Nicodemus say? Note he comes at night. First, uh, he comes at night because he is ashamed or embarrassed or afraid of what the other religious leaders might say. Uh, so, uh, but night has, you know, has a connotation also in the, in the Gospel of John. Night, darkness is lostness. The fact that he's coming to him at night shows that he's still lost. He's in the dark. He's not coming into the light yet. And so this man comes to him at night and he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher. Okay. So Jesus, who is God, Nicodemus just says, oh, you're a teacher. He just minimized who Jesus really is, right? He says, you are, we know you're a teacher come from God. For no one could perform these signs. So I see the signs that you're doing. So you, you must have God with you. You're a, you're a teacher come from God. But he missed the fact that Jesus is actually God. And that is significant. Have you ever encountered somebody, maybe famous or whatever, and you, you missed it? Somebody who was big and important in this world, and you missed it? Uh, my mom uh, and, and my dad... Uh, had breakfast with my my brother my older brother's in laws in Texas. My older brother's uh, in laws they have uh, own the largest car dealership in te- in, in uh, Texas, uh, the third largest in in the, in America. And uh, Troy Aikman, number eight on the you know used to be on the Dallas Cowboys, right uh, quarterback. Famous guy, right? Uh, it was one of their spokesmen, and my my parents were down there for breakfast, and they um, and they went out with the uh, with the in laws, uh, and Troy Aikman happened to be at this restaurant, and he comes to my parents' table and to to talk to uh, my brother's parents and uh, saying hi to them, and they introduce him to the table. You know, it's Troy, hi, that kind of thing, right? Uh, he leaves. After he leaves, my mom asks them, says, so who is that? Is he one of your employees? <laughs> Missed it. Uh, so they told that story to, to Troy afterwards, and he signed a football to Judy, my number one fan. And he has a good sense of humor. Uh, but uh, completely missed it. She's in the presence of a great, a legend, right? Um, and missed it. Nicodemus is in the presence of God, and he missed it. You're a great teacher. We know, you, we, 
We know you got some kind of connection with God. We know that you, you got some good stuff because you're doing some, some pretty cool things here in Jerusalem. You're a good teacher. Are you an employee of God? He's God. And he, and he missed it. And this story shows us this episode in Jesus' life, John puts it here because John is trying to show us the purpose of the gospel is jo- of John. He says at the, end of the, at the end of the gospel, he writes these things that you may believe in who Jesus is. And, that, and by believing in him, the actual Jesus, son of God, that you uh, might be saved. So the story is here to tell us that it matters what you believe about Jesus. Our world right now in America, we want to be very accepting of everybody. This is the, the, uh, the culture of tolerance, which is uh, in, in, in the idea of tolerance doesn't mean that there is right and wrong. It means that you believe whatever you want to believe, and that's fine. So whatever you believe about Jesus is great for you. Just don't tell me what I need to believe about Jesus. And so if you believe Jesus is a great teacher, wonderful, that's great. If you believe that he is a God, wonderful, that's what, that's what you believe, wonderful. No, but John is saying it matters what you believe about Jesus. You can't just say, well, Jesus is this to me, right? This what God is to me. No, I don't care what God is to you. I don't want, care what Jesus is to you. It matters who Jesus is. What we believe about Jesus is so important. What the Bible tells us about Jesus is so important. You've got the Muslims, right? They believe that Je- just like Nicodemus, Jesus is a great prophet, a good teacher. And that's it. The Mormons believe that Jesus was a child of God, that God has many wives and they have all these spirit children. You and I are all one of his spirit children, now have bodies, and Jesus was the firstborn of all of his spirit children. And so he became a God, just like you and I can become gods. But they don't believe that he is God. He is a God. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is Michael the archangel, that he was a created being, that he was created as Michael the archangel. He came to earth as Jesus, and now he is living as Michael the archangel again. Can we all just believe whatever we want to believe? And just, it's okay. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you believe what you want to believe. That's Jesus to you, great. If you're a Muslim and you believe he's a good teacher, a prophet, great. You believe that, that's wonderful. No, it matters what you believe about Jesus. And so Jesus' is a response to Nicodemus, he says, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What a, it's an odd, maybe, response. And a lot of times Jesus doesn't, like, directly uh, answer, like, what it, what it sounds like he should be responding to, uh, because he's getting at what's in the heart of man, who he's talking to. And Nicodemus thought, I'm a religious leader of the Jews. We are God's chosen people. We will enter the kingdom of God because we are Jews. And Jesus is saying, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Seeing the kingdom of God means entering the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. But I was born a Jew, so I'm already accepted. Right? It, it, it doesn't matter. Anything else that I do, I'm a Jew. So I'm, I'm automatically entered into the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, you need to be born again. Your Jewishness doesn't matter. Verse 4, he says, how can, uh, Nicodemus' response is, how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him, can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? And, you know, we don't know if Nicodemus was uh, being sarcastic, making fun of what Jesus said, or if he's truly confused, but he's not getting it, no matter what. He's not accepting what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, tell me more about this uh, being born again. I'd like to know, because if, that, if, that's, if, if there's something that you need to do to enter the kingdom of God, I want to know how to do that. Tell me more. That was not his response, which is what it should have been, Right? Um, he responds with this, nobody can be born twice 
You know, that doesn't make sense. If you're old, how can you be born again? Um, and uh, he, he chose this confusion, you could say. He didn't really want to know who the real Jesus was. He didn't, his response was not appropriate. Jesus uh, answered, he says, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus' answer, uh, Jesus' response is, you've got to be born of the water and the Spirit. And theologians debate on this. What does that mean? Born of water. We get, we get the Spirit, right? But what does it mean to be born of water? Uh, and some people, uh, including the Mormons, uh, would say that uh, b- the water means your physical birth. Because in order to become a god in Mormonism, uh, you have to become a human. Uh, if you can't become a human, you can't be tested and uh, prove your worthiness so as to become a god. Um, and so they look at this verse and they say that he's talking about physical birth, which it could still be physical birth, uh, but I don't think that's what he is saying here. That you got to be born and then born of the spirit, born of uh, you know physical birth and then spiritual birth, uh, because the Jews didn't have this concept. They didn't they didn't think of physical birth as being born of water. If that was a phrase in Judaism or a concept in Judaism, you'd say, yeah, that's probably what he was talking about. But more likely, he was referring to prophecies from the Old Testament, like in Ezekiel 36. And he's talking about spiritual birth. Both water and spirit have to do with a spiritual renewal. In in Ezekiel 36, verse 25, it says, I will also, it's Old Testament, talking about future. uh, When the new covenant comes, uh, when, when Jesus comes, Right, when the Messiah comes, he says, I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so this water is probably the water of cleansing, forgiveness. Repent and be baptized and and receive the Holy Spirit, right? The idea of repentance, being cleansed, and then having the Holy Spirit come um, into your life. And so we get forgiveness, we get, uh, you know, this through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, and then Jesus says, uh, I will send you my spirit to live within you. And so uh, somebody needs to be born of water and the spirit. They need to be spiritually Reborn. They need to ask for forgiveness of their sins. They need to understand that they are a sinner um, and, and have the Holy Spirit regenerate them, give them new birth. If they don't do that, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. It says, whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. If it's flesh, that's flesh. But I'm not talking about fleshly birth. I'm talking about spiritual birth. You've got to be born spiritually. And you religious leaders, you Jews, need a spiritual rebirth. It's not enough to be born in the flesh a Jew. You need to have a spiritual rebirth. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He was preaching a baptism of repentance. He was getting your hearts right for the Messiah. You have to have this spiritual cleansing, this renewal. Right? And then uh, he, he goes on, he says, Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear its sound. But you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, this is shocking. If you're Nicodemus hearing this, and if you understand what Jesus is saying, is the wind blows where it it goes, so the Holy Spirit does. You can't control it. And so that means the Holy Spirit is going to go to people that aren't just Jews. The Holy Spirit is coming and he's going to change Gentiles as well. And we're grateful for that. Those of us who aren't Jews, that Jesus came for us too. And we have the Holy Spirit in us. The Jews, according to this passage, don't get automatic entrance into the kingdom. Right? Um, we, they need to be filled with the Spirit. They need to be cleansed. John 9, 
Nicodemus' response shows that he was maybe understanding a little bit of what Jesus was saying and what this implies for the, the Jews. Because he says, how can these things be? How can these things be? Instead of saying, Jesus, uh, okay, what you're saying, it's, it's hard, you know, but I really want to be in the kingdom, so you know, tell me more about this. His response is, how can these things be? Because it doesn't fit my paradigm, my understanding. I'm a Jew, therefore I enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't make any sense. He had, again, the wrong response. And we're going to see, you know, this this, uh, account uh, with Nicodemus is going to end without us knowing what happens to Nicodemus. This is the last we hear of him uh, in in this story. We'll hear him a little bit later, uh, several chapters later in John, as he defends Jesus, but kind of secretly among the other religious leaders. He has not become a follower of Jesus. And at the end of the gospel, we'll see that he buries Jesus um, with jo- Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, so they came and they took Jesus' body off the cross, and uh, Nicodemus was there to help bury Jesus, which means he probably must have maybe at some point become a follower. But we don't know that until the very end of the, the gospel. John just gives us this encounter and Nicodemus' confusion and his lack of response to Jesus. And we can be the same way, right? Uh, Nicodemus had the wrong, wrong response to the good news. Jesus is giving him the good news, and his response was not what it should be. And so oftentimes in church or in places, we hear the good news. We hear the, the message preached. And what, what's our, our, our response? Ah, that's nice. You know, it's a good message. You kept me awake. All right? I didn't fall asleep this Sunday. And you, you all got an hour of sleep, so I, nobody has an excuse to fall asleep this week. Uh, but I, remember I, I left one church um, after being there for a, a, you know, a year preaching and stuff. And, and one guy, his, his compliment was, I never fell asleep while you were preaching. It's like, well, praise God. Uh, but that's not my, what I'm here to do, is just to keep you awake and entertain you, right? I'm trying to give you the good news and explain God's word in such a way that you would respond uh, to it. But that's not my job, to make you respond. That's the Holy Spirit, right? But, uh, you know, we could sit here, we could come every Sunday, and we could say, it was a nice service. I enjoyed the music. I, I stayed awake. It was interesting, or it was short. We got out on time. We made it in time to Pizza Hut. That was great. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. All right? What is our response? Do we have the wrong response, just like Nicodemus? Because we're still living for our lives in the comfort of our world. Our response needs to be, oh, that's the good news. That's the message. That's what God's word says. What do I need to do differently in my life? Is there anything that I need to change? Tell me. Help me change. Help me to be more like Christ. Is that our response? Or are we just here for another Sunday? Too often, I think we're Pharisees. Myself included. Too often we're Pharisees. We just, we, we, we're presented with the good news, the, 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 the Bible, and we just leave it there without letting the Spirit change us. And so Jesus' response to, to his, you know, uh, apparent confusion, verse 10, he says, Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, I expect more of you. Truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. Probably speaking, we don't know for sure, the we there, maybe the disciples. Uh, but says it, or Maybe he's talking... Trinity language, they're not sure exactly what the plural we is. It's debatable. It says, if I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay, so he's now saying the Son of Man 
has descended from heaven. The Son of Man, whoever that is, is from heaven and is revealing things to you. Understands things that earthly people do not understand. All right? And he's going to reveal that the Son of Man is, him, 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 well, I mean, he's not gonna necessarily going to reveal this, but he himself is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Son of Man. Uh, verse 14, he says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. What is he referring to when he talks about Moses? Uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the book of Exodus, the people, as, as, as always, were grumbling and complaining against God, uh, sinning against him, being rebellious. And so God sent serpents, venomous vipers, out amongst the Israelites, and, uh, and they bit the people, and the people were dying from the snake bites. And, uh, and Moses cried out to God on behalf of the people, and God said, uh, build, make a, a bronze servant. Put that on the end of your staff. Lift that up. And when people look to the bronze serpent, they will be saved from the venom. And everybody who looked to the bronze serpent was saved. And Jesus is using that as an analogy to the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who looks to the Son of Man, everybody who puts their trust in him for their salvation will be saved, will have eternal life. Jesus is saying the Son of Man is not merely a teacher. He is the way of salvation. For God so loved the world in this way he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And I, I didn't like the way the, the, the Christian Standard Bible did this at first, but they're actually correct. Uh, it, but it changes the way that we've always said this. It doesn't mean the other versions are incorrect, but we kind of, we, there's, it's, it's unclear in the other translations. Did you notice as we read this? Uh, for God, so, for God loved the world in this way. Oh, it's supposed to be so. God so loved the world, right? Uh, that word so in the Greek means in this way. It, it, we, in, in English, it's, it, you know, it could mean this way or thusly. But it, it can also mean like uh, quality or quantity and oftentimes because it's unclear when we say for God so loved the world we're talking about God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son but that is not what Jesus was saying that's true that he loved the world so much that he sent but that's not what this verse actually he's saying God loved the world in this way this is how he loved the world by sending his son You might not like that because, you know, you're like, well, but I still like it the way that I, this is what Jesus said. You can just, you take it up with him when you die. Uh, but uh, it is, Jesus was saying that God loved the world thusly. Nowhere does that Greek word mean so much. Uh, it means thusly. Uh, and so God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. This is how he demonstrates his love for us, Right? As Romans 5, 8 says, um, he gave his one and only son. Now, what does that mean, he gave his one and only son? This, you know, some people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He's claiming to be God right here. And, he, and there's many places that you can turn to where he claims to be God. But <clears throat> it says, uh, for God loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son. What does that mean, his one and only son? If I said that my Dog gave birth to one and only puppy, right? Gave birth to, uh, there's one and only son of this dog. So this dog had one and only son. What is that? A dog, right? Because a dog gives birth to a dog. You wouldn't think it gave birth to a monkey or a human or something else. 
If I, if I said, this is a born of a dog, you'd say, it's a dog. When Jesus says that he's the one and only son of God, he's saying, I am God. I'm not a mere teacher. I'm not a created being. I'm not an angel. I am God. I'm not one of many spirit children like the Mormons say. I am God. And it matters what you think of me, Nicodemus. I am not a mere teacher or prophet. Uh, and verse 17 says, For God did not send a son to the world to condemn the world. Now he explains his mission. He did not send a son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Jesus came to save. The Son of Man came to save. The one and only Son came to save the world, not to condemn the world. He was here not judging the world. That wasn't his mission at that time. But he is coming back another time, and he is going to condemn the world. He's going to say, is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Have I paid the price for your sins? Have you accepted my salvation or not? Have you put your trust in me? Not as a teacher, not as a prophet, not as an angel, but as a son of God who takes away the sins of the world. What do you believe in me? Have you ever put your trust in me? Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? Come into my kingdom. All right? That judgment day is coming. We don't know when, and it's like a, re like a report card, right? A report card in school is the final condemnation. It's where all of your work shows, right, what you got. The other day, uh, Claire came to me and said, Dad, I know how to turn an F into an A. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. Uh, though I don't think they get Fs and As, uh, uh, those grades. And she didn't have anything to worry about. But somewhere she learned, uh, you know, probably on TikTok or something like that, uh, how you turn an F into an A, like, you know, by adding an extra line there and stuff. And she showed me how to make an F and A. I don't think she has to worry about that. She's a good student. But, um, you, know, you know, students worry about that. Here's the, you know, and, and, and the report card that gives us our final grade, that A or the F, is telling us what we have done if we have shunned uh, education up to this point and not studied, then we are getting what we deserve. We already have the condemnation. And that final day is coming, and you already are condemned if you have not accepted Jesus Christ. The condemnation will come, the final judgment, but you're already judged if you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ. You need to give, put your trust in him now, the report card shows you what you've been doing. That final judgment is going to show you what you've been doing. Jesus is not here to condemn the world at that time, but you're already condemned if you don't put your trust in him because we're all sinners. We're all F students. But Jesus, Jesus came to change our Fs to As. We don't need to change that. We can't do that on our own. Jesus says, I'm going to take your F life and I'm going to give you an A if you put your trust in me. That's the good news. And this story finishes in verse 19 through 21. It says, this is the judgment. The judgment is coming. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. What is Jesus saying? Light and darkness. It's like a bad report card. You get a bad report card, you don't run to your parents with that one. You don't say, look at all my F's. Right? We hide that. We try and see, is there any way that I can make this F look like an A? We don't want to take it to our parents. 
for those who are in the darkness, they want to stay in the darkness. They don't want to come out into the light. But the good report cards, you know, your parents put it on the refrigerator. You want to show them that, and they post it up there for everybody to see. In the same way, those of us who want to come to Jesus, who want salvation, will come into the light. But those who prefer their lives in the darkness will stay in the darkness. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and Jesus pointing this out. Do you want to stay in the darkness, Nicodemus? We're here at night. You're afraid of what everybody else will think of you. You're living in darkness because you don't even recognize who I actually am. Is this where you want to stay, Nicodemus? Do you prefer the darkness or are you coming into the truth? Nicodemus kept Jesus at a safe distance. You're a good teacher, okay? I don't have to change anything in my life if I just recognize you as a good teacher. Are we keeping Jesus at a distance? So yeah, I'm going to believe this, whatever it is about Jesus, because then I don't have to change anything in my life. I can just keep doing whatever I want to do. Because I prefer the darkness. I prefer living life however I want to live life, not according to, to your word. Do you keep Jesus at a safe and manageable difference? Are you ready to make change, real change in your life? I want so much more for myself. I want so much more for our church than where we're at now. This is a great place. This is a great church, great family. There's so much potential. But there are so many lost people. Are we willing to do something different? Are we willing to make changes so that the lost can be found? Or do we just want to keep living life the way that we live it? Trying to, you know, kind of be good people, you know, so that no one says anything negative about us, so we have a good reputation. Do we care more about what man thinks or what God thinks? Are we living for that final report card? So that when we stand before for Jesus, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with much. Much will be given to you. Let's pray. Lord God, your word is tough. Change is tough. Crucifying ourselves is tough, and denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following you is tough. But Lord, there's no other place. We know there's no other place that is re as rewarding as right in the middle of your will, being in your presence, having you walking alongside of us, having your Holy Spirit empower us, living for you and not for ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, for our selfishness. Forgive us for our self-centeredness as individuals, as a church. We give you ourselves. We give you everything. And we ask, Lord, that you would lead us, that you would guide us. Not so that, just so that we can get praise or so we can feel good about anything, but because there are people dying out there that are going to spend eternity in hell. And, Lord, we ask that you would give us such a love for the lost, such a love for the world, that as you sacrificed your son, we would sacrifice ourselves, that, the, that those who are in darkness will come into the light. Help us, Lord to be your hands, your feet. Empower us to do your will as individuals and as the church. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.